Hey, are we online? Welcome to anybody coming into this. I'm not sure that I'm posting this uh, stream onto YouTube. I might just do it on Twitch. I had a little bit of uh, spare time, so I just wanted to hop on and work on my hour and streaming requirements um, for becoming a Twitch affiliate so I can upload the videos over there. But yeah, if anybody wanders into this chat, um, I'll take some questions. Otherwise, like I said, I just had a little spare time and wanted to hop on for a surprise stream. Uh, probably only going to be on for about a half an hour, if even that long, but I uh, just wanted to put in a little time and, again, get the uh, number of um, streams up a little bit. Welcome to whoever, I see one person in the audience, I'm not sure, just doing a surprise stream, I had a little time, I'm trying to get up to, I think it's eight hours to make Twitch affiliate, so just wanted to put in a little time, go be monkey, it's you, okay, yeah, I'm not even sure that I'm putting this up on YouTube, I just kind of, like I said, I, I was, uh, I had a little free time, so, uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to finish any files today, so, Thought I would do some kind of interaction uh, with something S4A related. So yeah, I heard from people who said that uh, they're not getting alerts when I go live, even though there's like 200 people that are subscribed to the channel now, but they're not getting alerted by Twitch. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, did did you get a uh, Twitch alert? Oh, we got two people now. Just a surprise stream and probably not a very long one. Okay, just on the site and so. Okay. Well, apparently there's two people, so I'm not I'm not really even gonna advertise this. I'm just uh like I said, just working on my hours for the Twitch affiliate thing, so as long as there's uh three people actually even if there's not, you only have to, to make affiliate average three people watching. I think I'm averaging like 25 so far, so even if we've got below three technically, uh, I think that's still not going to drag down the average, uh, you know, to a point where it's going to hurt the affiliate status, so. But yeah, um, I don't know. I guess uh, I'll just kind of chill here. There's not anything too much I have on my mind, but if anybody has any questions or anything, just want to chat. Uh, then it can only help the Twitch status, so why not? Oh, and there's a third. So yeah, as I said, uh, we're just doing a surprise stream. I'm only going to be on here for like half an hour tops. Uh, just had a little free time just jumping on to see if I can get in another half an hour towards the Twitch affiliate requirements. So feel free to ask any questions or whatever you want to do. Do I plan on using Twitch for clips for YouTube? I mean, I do post, uh, so I have on the schedule now scheduled streams from um, Tuesday, uh, well, st scheduled streams Tuesday and Saturday from 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern to for about two hours, so like 4 o'clock, 7 o'clock, depending on the time zone. Um, so I do repost those over on YouTube. People seem to get something out of them and you know, it's more content for the channel, so why not? Um, as far as, like, uh, you know, using Twitch as, like, for recording audiobooks, no, no. I have a different uh, setup that I use for that. Um, you know, and it's just, it's really different when I, when I record audiobooks and things or current events commentary or anything. Um, you know, I like to think... Oh, hold on, there's trucks. 
All right, there's so much road noise here. It drives me crazy. But, um, yeah, I uh, anyway, I think pretty pretty hard about what I'm saying in those videos, and uh, I edit them, you know, down. Uh, it's kind of like, um, you know, in various school programs I've done, I have done so much typing in my life. I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, research papers and whatever. Um that I kind of hate, like, I don't, I don't do scripts for my things, but I do, you know, sometimes we'll make notes and things, but I, it's so much easier for me to just talk into a microphone than type, it just kind of drives me crazy. But anyway, uh, the point is, even though I am speaking rather than typing, uh, there's a lot of thought put into it, and I will back things up and edit them, and I just don't see being able to do that easily on Twitch, because what comes out live in real time is just not the same as when I sit down and give it some thought in front of a microphone and I'm able to like record over things or stuff like that so no not really so much for clips for YouTube though I'll, I'll probably put up the whole streams if that is if that answers the question I think it probably does um, no actually more the other way around I plan on using Twitch for uh, like a backup of what's on YouTube. So I, I want to put the audiobooks that I make, which primarily are going on to YouTube right now, I want to uh, use Twitch as a backup for that. Though I probably will keep streaming, um, you know, on some kind of an ongoing regular basis because people tend to like it. That said, I mean, it's never going to be the focus of what I do. Uh, you know, you look at how shallow the streaming culture really is and just how, like, trash so many of the takes are from like people who are just on here incessantly whether it's Vosh or anybody else that just streams on like a daily basis I'm sorry but nobody has that much to say nobody uh, nobody at all <laughs> and the fact that these people are on here that much first of all I think it's uh, they're probably trying to keep twitch partner status <clears throat> because the um, what you have to first of all let me just say I, I had some kind of cold this past week and my voice has been a little bit off I think I'm coming out of it now but my recording yesterday I kind of sounded like rah, 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 and I'm still clearing my throat a lot but it's a lot better anyway what was I saying uh, people trying to stream every day I think it's for twitch partner status because if you look at what you need to do like you can kind of be a random twitch user and then you can be an affiliate to me, affiliates like you can uh, stream twice a week and make affiliate. That's reasonable. To become a Twitch partner, you have to stream. I think it's like 25 days out of the month or something. So you really have to do it full time. I mean, if you're just playing video games, something really shallow like that, then okay, fine. If you're trying to do politics every day like that and you don't have like a team of writers, I just don't see quality content coming out of that even as a remote possibility. So I think, again, material conditions, it's like these people are trying to make a living as a Twitch streamer, and to be a partner, you have to stream fucking constantly. And I think that that's why. They're just on here whether or not they have anything to say. So I don't really want to get into that kind of situation where I'm just like, I have to talk every day whether or not there's anything to talk about. So anyway, good question. Led to a good five minutes of uh, me filling filling airtime here so yeah i see three people we had a max of five i guess that wasn't interesting enough for two of them um anybody else got a question anything at all what kind of pets do you all have no i mean whatever like i said i'm just jumping on here for a little bit to uh log some more affiliate time so you know anything anybody wants to mention or ask okay hydrophobic 64 first time chat hello new leftist here hello to you here, my, uh, my family is Hispanic, and whenever I hear them talk about Fidel Castro, they say he's a dictator who forcefully stayed in power and abused human rights. But listening to the new video, history will absolve me. He seems like a respectable man with good values. What is my take on how he ran the government? So, um, I am not an expert on Cuba, so I am not the best person to ask about that. However, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the speech, history will absolve me. So that's from 1953. It was from kind of the beginning of what became, you know, Cuba's revolutionary struggle that ultimately resulted in the government that it has today. 
And Castro at that time was coming from more of a place of just like a patriotic rebellion against uh, who he saw as kind of like a right-wing dictator unconstitutionally usurping the established Cuban government, which was capitalist, but it was born out of sort of popular revolts in the late 19th century. So Castro, I think, was coming from more of a place of patriotism for that. However, I think that probably in the process of fighting the guerrilla war that they fought, because then Castro um, was in prison for a few years, and then the government let him out to kind of get good PR. But then uh, Castro went right back to leading the armed uh, rebellion. So um, it started from more of a place of patriotism and trying to restore what he saw as like legitimate constitutional government, or at least those were the arguments that he and his people were kind of making at the time. They wanted to get Batista out because Batista was a cruel dictator, etc. And, um, you know, they, they succeeded at that. It was not really Marxist-Leninist at that time. However, I think that it became clear to everyone involved in that that aligning with the USSR rather than the USA was going to be the necessary move. They did adopt, you know, from, I, I think it was pretty early, like the first or second year, uh, they adopted more of a Marxist-Leninist approach, but it wasn't that in initially. So people sometimes will call it revisionist for that reason. I don't think there's really any reason to do that. Uh, you know, it started out more as like a patriotic rebellion, and then they acquired a socialist viewpoint. Whether or not is because the USSR made them do it, they did it, and it led to the development of socialism. So, who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my opinion. Um, as far as, you know, what happened in Cuba after that, I am not like the greatest expert. I'm not a, you know, historian on Cuba. I have not even read a ton about it specifically. As far as the like human rights things, um, you know, again, any time that we're talking about socialism and human rights, we have to remember the context of if they were to relent at all, the United States would overthrow them without blinking an eye. So that is always like issue one in understanding the conditions in which a socialist nation, particularly in the 20th century, found itself and trying to understand its actions from there. I mean, so all of that said, um, Cuba actually ranks fairly high on the list of people in prison per capita, like per population. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of people in prison. Uh, you know, can you, is there room for debate there? Yeah, there's probably some room for good faith debate there. Also, what they've been able to do despite the conditions that they've found themselves in is amazing. I mean, the amount of people, you know, interested, particularly, I mean, so close to the United States, the amount of people interested uh, and, you know, that have the means, motive, and opportunity to try to overthrow Cuban socialism is massive. So the things that they feel that they've had to do to hold on to socialism and not fall back into being like a colony again and being exploited by imperialism I mean, I think that that's the thing. Like I said, I'm not really a, a historian of Cuba. I'm sure in the next few years we'll get into more of that on the channel. I think that they made great contributions to the socialist uh, cause. That said, I'm sure that your um, family members aren't necessarily particularly interested in that. But this is some of the problem is people will be really swayed by the kind of lies that the um, imperialist newspapers will make up about the government. So like actually just in using this example of Castro alone, in the four audiobooks of Castro that I have up there, um, actually let me go to the channel real quick and just find, because there's one in particular where Castro actually specifically talks about uh, after they had their revolution that the newspapers were lying about. Like so the Cuban revolution was notoriously peaceful. They were extremely... Um, kind towards the soldiers who had fought for Batista and they they weren't just like slaughtering Batista's people at all. It was one of the most peaceful social socialist revolutions in that sense. Let me just find this speech. See if I can find the speech specifically that I'm referring to. Uh, it might be the revolution begins now. 
uh, I think might be the one. It's either that or I think establishing revolutionary vigilance in Cuba. Anyway, there's only four of them up on the channel, and most of them are short. If you got through History Will Absolve Me, uh, you can make it through the, the other four. There's also some uh, from Che Guevara, including notes for the study of the ideology of the Cuban Revolution. That's from 1960, and in that one they get into kind of how they adopted Marxism, uh, even though it didn't start with that. So yeah, like I don't know what exactly your family's um, class background is or anything like that. So I don't know, you know, what their class interests would be in a socialist Cuba versus a um, you know capitalist Cuba, counter revolutionary type of Cuba. Um, so I can't speak to that. And I don't know what pieces of propaganda may have persuaded them and. By the way, I use propaganda neutrally. Propaganda is just comes from the word propagate, so it's taken on a negative connotation, but it's can mean anything that is put out there just to propagate a particular viewpoint. Oftentimes, you know, people associate it with being misleading, but anyway, so I don't know what they have heard that convinced them uh, that Castro is a dictator, forcefully stayed in power, abused human rights, etc. Uh, so I think you'd have to kind of take that on more of like a point by point basis if you wanted to have a productive conversation with them. I mean, but I think also just the amount of advancements that they've been able to make. Imagine if the blockade wasn't there. I mean, the amount of advancements they've made in medicine and in other areas is stunning. So I don't know. And like, does your family stand the United States? Because the United States is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the prison population. If they're big on human rights, they should also not be a fan of the United States. So anyway, you know, that's that's that. As far as how Castro ran the government, uh, maybe we'll get into that more at some point. I, I can't comment in detail on that, unfortunately. So anyway, that's my answer to that question. Very good question. Thank you for the question. So for anybody else in the audience, we're just doing a surprise stream here. I had a little bit of free time and just hopped on to do some Twitch hours as we go towards affiliate. And uh, just taking any questions or comments. does not have to be profound if you don't want it to be. <laughs> just, uh, you know, killing some time here on stream as we work towards affiliate. So then I can upload audiobooks onto Twitch. You can, like when you join Twitch, they don't let you upload right away. They let you stream, but... In order to upload, you got to do a certain amount of uh, streaming hours first. So we're just paying our dues right now, I guess you could say. So, well, I'll say if uh, until somebody has a question, I am currently in the process of recording Lenin's 1913, I believe the title is Critical Remarks on the National Question. We're doing a whole bunch of uh, nationalism and internationalism oriented texts. I just completed and this took me forever, and I was kind of annoyed, <laughs> kind of annoyed at how long it was. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg's The National Question from 1909. And then uh, a couple of pieces from Lenin, the critical remarks, which I just mentioned. Uh, another one from Lenin from 1914. The name is eluding me. Again, it has National Question in the, uh, in the title. And then a couple from Stalin on the subject. So wanting to get into that. Um, I will say that the interesting thing that I found so far, and we'll see how this holds reading these through for the channel, is uh, one of the most divisive things that have come up in the past year, although I'm glad that the sort of online socialist community did decide to start parsing through it and sorting it out, is um, the question of proletarian patriotism. The thing that I noticed in the Lenin text that I was doing today he talks about bourgeois nationalism versus socialist internationalism. He does not talk about patriotism, all right? Uh, he talks about, um, you know, rejecting nationalism and basically promoting internationalism, meaning uh, fight against your local bourgeoisie, fight against your local landlords, reject bourgeois wars, things like that. Uh, and that that you know that's the internationalist position of the international working class because that's in the interest of the entire international working class is to fight the local bourgeoisie and all that but to put it in a language and adapt it to whatever conditions exist there so like you know if there's a particularly notorious landlord in your area then make your propaganda about that 
or you know whatever the history is in the local area where you're trying to rally workers to that internationalist message then you want to adapt it to that so give it the national flavor of what it whatever it is like make it relevant to the people you're talking to but it, it, it explicitly rejects any kind of bourgeois nationalism so you know and he also mentions um and i've seen this sometimes in connection with proletarian patriotism he will uh, lenin said that um, you should try, as communists doing this propaganda, to uh, try to, you know, if, if there is any sort of existing history of this sort of internationalist, anti-capitalist struggle, then to play that up and, you know, have people feel proud about that. He specifically doesn't talk about patriotism. So to me, um, the introduction of the concept of patriotism, and we'll see if it comes up more in in the other writings that I'm doing in this series. Patriotism is such an abstraction and uh, you know let's talk about nationalism and internationalism. Patriotism like love of country weirdly divisive and, and I just don't think that that's the thing we need to be talking about so anyway you know I think that uh, a lot of times when people try to defend what they call proletarian patriotism they're talking more about class solidarity just adapted to local characteristics. So anyway, um, this, is a, this is a thing I think has not been, you know, finally sorted out, but I hope to make a, a contribution to it uh, in the coming weeks. So that'll be a, more of that up on the channel soon. That's my priority right now. Comrade Lib says, well, I do more hanging with the Sock Dem gang. Haven't seen one of those in a while. Yeah, they drive me nuts. Um, I, I basically, I reached a point where I feel like I have enough threads going on the channel where I haven't felt that inclined to do one because I watch them and I uh, the reason I haven't done as many is I feel like I've kind of said most of what you can say. Um, you know, I've been more interested in covering COVID. I think that that's not being done properly almost anywhere. Uh, so I've been more interested in doing that. So that's taken priority over Sock Dem Gang. Like, to me, the Sock Dem Gang criticisms, that came more from a place of, first of all, trying to build the channel where I didn't have name recognition and these other names did. So that was part of it. But I mean, also, you know, it is important for socialists to contrast our political perspective and our worldview uh, against you know, reformists and whatever. So it is important, and they're up on the channel. It's not like I'm taking them down. At a certain point, though, it's like, you know, when you've done five Kyle Kalinske videos, it's they pretty much are identical. Also, the videos are just tedious for me to make, so I don't really enjoy it that much. But, I don't know, possibly more in the future. Anyway, the other thing I was going to say is a lot of those were coming out of early 2021 and summer 2021 what happened then uh biden got elected so basically you know there was more like the left had kind of stalled out at that point and it seemed to me like doing some videos about you know as the left is trying to regroup you know trump's out of power biden's in power um it made sense to kind of emphasize that the pandemic was kind of more in hand at that point, so I wasn't doing the COVID coverage as much, and it seemed like kind of nothing was happening in general, so that's kind of why I did more of those videos. You may see them one again. I know people find them entertaining. Also, they're like kind of stressful for me to do. I get pissed when I watch those things, and like, I know there's some entertainment value there, but like, I also don't want to just be like the guy who gets mad at like, you know, angry video game nerd of like, sock them videos. Like, that's not really like what I do in real life. And I'm more interested in like doing quality education. I feel like I kind of made those points. Um, if I was to do a reaction video, like I did the Russell Brand one, but again, it's like, I can only take them in shorter and shorter doses at this point. I watched the brand thing for about 10 minutes and I was like, all right, I'm fucking done. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's harder to do. Like I can't take a 20 or 30 minute video and like break that down it'll take me two hours so especially when i just feel like there's probably something else i can do that can make the same points but like a little better but yeah they're they're stressful for me to make too they're just like i get <laughs> legitimately angry that's not like an act so 
Yeah, it's just frustrating. But, you know, I think that those videos also for me marked, like, I kind of wanted to do two things with the channel primarily. It was like the mission was I wanted to read more Marx and Engels and Lenin and Mao and all that stuff and, like, get that out there for the world and kind of teach that more. And I also wanted to do kind of more of like an actually socialist alternative to humanist report and secular talk and TYT and all that crap. So I feel like, you know, staying true to that sort of mission, I can do that with or without the Sock Dem Gang clips, and I just haven't felt the need to do it. Also, like, I tried doing the uh, Hanging with the Bread Tube Gang, and it's just like, I'd rather just kind of do my own thing at this point. Like, I feel like I can make my points better. Plus, the audience now, we're nearing 6,400 subs. Like, there's enough people listening even without doing that. All that said, uh, I think that if I was going to do another one, I do have the like Jordan Peterson Zizek debate, so I'm I'm aware that uh, I'm, first of all I'm not a Zizek fan at all. I'm even less of a Jordan Peterson fan to say the least. I hate that guy uh, like deeply, passionately, maybe not passionately, but uh, I coldly deeply hate him. Um, I might do some summary of that at least. Uh, you know, you have kind of, you know, Jordan Peterson railing against Marx. Zizek is not exactly like a great defender of Marx, to say the least. And just kind of two people talking about Marx, neither of whom seems to completely really know what they're talking about. So anyway, uh, horror click thoughts on the zeitgeist movements and groups like it. Utopian socialist. Yeah, I mean, I guess the word that pops to mind is inevitable. Uh, you're going to get these things. I didn't follow the Zeitgeist movement closely. I remember when the first movie came out in 2008, and it had, I think, if I recall correctly, three parts. Uh, they basically, in the first part, um, what were they talking about? It was religion. I remember that, like, it was a lot about astrology. And they were basically saying how, like, Christianity was just, like, you know, warmed over, like, paganism and... Uh, I, I recall seeing another documentary called The God That Wasn't There, something like that, that basically it seemed like Zeitgeist pretty much just copy-pasted into section one of their thing. And that's fine. I mean, people should understand that religion is, you know, less about, um, you know, having a, a real invisible sky friend and following its moral dictates and more like, People create an abstraction representing the morality that that society, the ruling class of that society feels is necessary for that society and that they need to maintain their class rule and that, you know, people create gods, not the other way around. I mean, yeah, fully. So that was good. And it came at a time when like Google video, uh, you know, low budget documentaries were really coming into their own. So it came out of that time period. Um, it was an interesting time when people were just starting to realize the power of like video based social media. Again, it's like 2008, it was like finally everybody was getting broadband or it was getting a lot more common anyway. So people were making documentaries like that. The second part was on 9-11 Truth. I, I fully support that. Unfortunately, there's a ton of right wingers in that movement. So it became practically impossible to work in it, but yeah, I do I do uh, not support the, the government version of 9-11. I think that it was basically a right-wing plot to start a meta war called the War on Terror. I don't think that the official story holds up at all, and I don't think it's hard to see that. And then the third part, I think, was about income tax. They were doing that whole, there was, who was that guy? Aaron Russo, that director. Boy, this is taking me back. Uh, like partnered with Alex Jones to do like a documentary, quote unquote, exposing the IRS and the Federal Reserve. That I think was a lot more questionable, a lot more right wing. So that's what I remember of Zeitgeist. And then apparently that guy, what's his name? Is his name Peter Joseph? Um, started like a whole movement around it. I mean, I, you know, people seem to be allergic to trying to do anything related to Marxism. Just to me, it's the only thing that can't, <clears throat> excuse me, can't really, if you stick to it, um, get like commodified easily. So that's kind of why I do it, because, you know, it, it has resulted in real revolutions, uh, the real 
abolition of bourgeois rule. So, you know, it's like I just stick to that. People are always like, oh, yeah, well, we want to avoid the, uh, you know, legacy of atrocity of Marxist regimes. And it's like, you know, odds are they don't know what they're talking about. Odds are, particularly in the U.S., that they got some kind of George Orwell take on what the USSR was, and they don't really know. So anyway, that's, I guess, some of my take. It's just, we need to step it up. You know, that's another slogan I have on the channel is raising the bar. It's time to move on from these like 20th century Cold War propaganda notions of like what socialism is about, dust off the books, go through it, read the history, read the theory. So anyway, that's kind of my take. I, I have met uh, real life zeitgeist movement followers, <clears throat> two of them. I think fellow traveler said, another YouTuber fellow traveler said that he started out kind of in that and, you know, through studying Marxism, like has seen its deficits, but it was a starting point. Just, you know, it was like getting involved with the anti-war movement was for me. Uh, you know, it's a starting point. You kind of refine it from there. If people take it off as a jumping off point and then move on to better things, which I think is inevitable because the utopian socialist things, they're not really satisfying. Like, and I think that why people kind of latch onto that is because it's the best that they can find at a particular time. Like, you got to go out of your way to find this stuff. It's not easy to just be like, well, and in fact, that's, again, one part of the point of S4A is like, it's in the name, Socialism for All. I'm trying to make this more accessible to people so that you can get onto the real shit faster, you know, so that people don't have to, you know, trudge around in the uh, Andrew Yang zeitgeist movement backwater. You can just get to the real thing, like, a lot more quickly. That's the idea. Um, so, yeah, the other zeitgeist movement person that I found in real life was a coworker, And they were all about, like, they like this person really wanted change. Uh, you know, they were uh, not college educated. They were, you know, just high school uh, to, to work, proletarian, true wage slave. And, you know, they, they were not totally consumed with uh, bourgeois propaganda. They were like, I re we really need social change. I like some of what Bernie Sanders is saying. I like what Andrew Yang's saying. He had uh, <clears throat> been into Zeitgeist and, you know, some of those ideas. You know, and I tried, uh, that was somebody who had, you know, uh, explored a lot of these things and I tried to put them on more to Marxism and stuff. And so, I mean, there's, there's people out there who it is a positive stepping stone for. So, um, Hydrophobic says, thanks for the answer. The people of Cuba seem to have loved Castro. So that's why I asked. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very popular, <laughs> very popular there. Uh, my family is working class from third world countries and are first generation immigrants. They have more progressive views, but are very new to socialism, communism, mainly because of all the propaganda they have seen about countries like Cuba. Yeah, I mean, that's unfortunately typical. And uh, that's why we need more socialist media outlets that can counter that propaganda and that people can show to their family members who, excuse me, been uh, propagandized and try to undo some of that. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I hope in the, in the coming years, it probably won't be overnight, but I hope you can get them to come around. You know, it's entirely possible. You know, any working class people, there's some potential there. And even petty bourgeois, there's some potential to, like, just see what their class interests are and then to just, you know, get past the imperialist lies about our options as working class people. Uh, Comrade Liv, have, have I announced? No, this is a surprise stream. I'm actually probably going to be getting off soon. This is not a regular stream. Uh, so, yeah. As long as we average three viewers, I am contributing to my uh, Twitch affiliate needs. So, yeah. We got six now. Anyway, uh, speaking of, I'll probably take another question or two and then wrap up. The normal uh, scheduled streaming times are Tuesday and Saturday, 2 p.m., Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern for about an hour and a half or two hours. Uh, I just hopped on today because I had a little bit of spare time and, you know, we're working towards, I think it's eight hours and seven total streams in 30 days to get affiliates. So, you know, anyway, we got, we got seven in the audience. I think even if there was only one in the audience, the um, average number of viewers was uh, actually higher uh, it was like 25. So even if I ran for two hours with nobody watching, I think the average would still stay above three. 
So yeah, going for 34 minutes, seven people in the audience. Like I said, I'll probably take another question or comment or two and then probably get off uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to throw out there for discussion or consideration, but um, now would be the time. I love dead air. I just have to say I love dead air. You're not supposed to do dead air. Dead air is great. People are like, what's going on? Why is there dead air? It's just, just dead air, that's all. All right, well, 30-second countdown. If I don't get any other comments, I know the people who just want me to stay on are going like, to be like, I need a comment. Uh... If I don't get any other questions or comments, I will be logging off. But I thank everyone for joining. Uh, and we put in another 36 minutes or so towards the Twitch affiliate status. Dice to Tofu says, good stream. Well, thank you. Yeah, I definitely, those were good questions. I think we had some, uh, some good answers there. Uh, for anybody who joined late, um, I am recording... Um, Lenin's critical remarks on the national question. We're going to be doing a bunch of nationalism and internationalism related uh, audiobooks and discussions on the channel. So we can expect that in the next week, week and a half. Otherwise, yeah, I'm going to log off. So thanks again to everybody who joined. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going up on YouTube or not. Maybe, but uh, again, this was not a regularly scheduled stream, just a surprise stream. These will happen from time to time. So I don't know, you know, uh, if you turn the alerts on on Twitch or how that works. But yeah, I guess once in a while I'll probably jump on. All right, I'm going to head out. So thanks, everyone, for listening again. Thanks for the questions and comments. We'll catch you next time. Uh, there will be videos up in the meantime, but the next stream is Saturday, which I guess is the 19th. Uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern for a couple hours. Later.